grand finale here, we have a little bit of a reacting to do. Um, let me go ahead and do the little intro, and then we'll explain what exactly we're going to be doing. So here we go. Alrighty, so we're going to be reacting to a little bit of theology talk today. Um, so uh, I want to start off by introducing um, who we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about Mike Winger today. Now, I'm saying this as someone who's a big fan of Mike Winger. He has, uh, well, I can look at it right now, actually, since we're here. He's got about, um, yeah, he's got 470K subscribers on YouTube. Um and he does really great work. Like right now I'm working my way through his, uh, well, I'm following along with it. I'm, I'm, I'm up to date with it. But he's doing a series on women in ministry, which is awesome. Um, and I would recommend it to anybody who wants a, a really fair and balanced complementarian study of the topic. Uh, if you're aware of the debate between egalitarianism and complementarianism in terms of women in ministry, that's he's doing really well, like breaking down all the scholars on both sides and really breaking down what their arguments actually are. And so if you get through that series, you can really avoid talking past someone you disagree with. So that's uh, something that's really great about it. Uh, but he covers a lot of other topics too. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately today we're going to be talking about a clip where he said something I think both of us would disagree with um, because we come from uh, the X 29 church planting network currently um, and, uh, if you had to classify us, we're sort of something like a reformed Baptist style denomination. Um, it's, well, it's a network, it's not a denomination, but, um, but, uh, one of the parts of the network are the, the distinctives, the distinctives are reformed Calvinistic. So it's, um, but then it's like Baptist in its, um, view of baptism and it's, uh, and we are also, um, a little bit charismatic <laughs> as well, um, <laughs> at least uh, at least on paper um, we try. Uh, but anyways, uh, <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, in a one of the things Mike Winger does is he um, he does uh, twenty questions live streams and uh, takes questions from the chat. And he took a question from a viewer on uh, Reformed theology where they uh, where they ask him what he thinks about a passage that relates to God choosing us for salvation, uh, which of course for the Calvinist relates to the doctrine of election, predestination. And uh, while we are Calvinists, Mike Winger is not. And while I agree with him on a bunch of stuff, I just kind of have to listen along and cringe a little bit and disagree a little bit when he talks about it. Um, but we're going to go ahead and examine his answer to this question. So how do we want to do this? Do we want to watch it once through and then break it down piece by piece after that, or just p start and stop yeah. from the beginning? It through and we can break it down. All right. So let's, uh, let's do this. All right. So. Kenna Lynch has a question. That's better. Um, how do you interpret second Thessalonians two thirteen in light of the debate on the doctrine of election? Thank you for your work. It is a huge blessing. Thank you, Kenna. And, um, I will go to that passage now. Second Thessalonians two thirteen. Uh, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So th the idea here could be like, hey, God has chosen you. Um, and I can see why I'm trying to think of how like a Calvinist would use this passage in a robust way. Okay, there, there's a not robust way. There, there's a not robust way that maybe some people would use the passage. And they'd say, look, it says that God chose them. So therefore they were chosen. And that's Calvinism. God chooses you. But that's actually not Calvinism. Um, Calvinism is, is saying more than that. It's saying that God chose you and that you believing in him happened after your regeneration after. This is one of the key issues that even R.C. Sproul said was one of the key issues in Calvinism. If you understood it, you understood a lot of the debate. In Calvinism, there is a belief that you believe in God as a result of God re regenerating you. This is like that moment where you become a new creation in Christ, right? You're filled with the Spirit, right? You're indwelt by the Spirit, and you're a new person. You're forgiven, and you're given a new heart, 
now you can't help but believe in God. So that faith comes after regeneration or as a result of regeneration. Some will say it comes at the same time, but the point is that it comes as a result of regeneration, not you have faith and then you're regenerated. So let's read this verse again and ask if it says that. And the answer is going to be no. Um, but we always, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you, I would agree with that, as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. I actually would say this verse may lean against Calvinism because of that last part. How did they get saved? Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So that believing was somehow an active cause of them being saved. Not a result, a cause. That seems to be something that's there. So God chose you, but you also believed. And that that was one of the things that caused you, right here, to be saved. So I would actually lean this verse towards a, a verse that would perhaps challenge the Calvinist doctrine that regeneration comes before faith. Okay, there's his answer. Uh, so... Do you have any initial thoughts or do you want to start at the beginning and sort of take it piece by piece? Uh, yeah, maybe it's best just to take it from the top and piece by piece. Okay. All right. So I, I already have a lot of thoughts on this. I watched this a couple times. <laughs> there's a, yeah. there's, there's a couple issues I want to point out in terms of what he does here. Um, he doesn't do a terrible job. He, uh, I kind of want to, I don't want to summarize everything up front, but like, I feel like what he does is he he summarizes our position and then applies it where we wouldn't. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. What, yeah. Okay. Kenna Lynch has a question. Um, how do you interpret Second Thessalonians two thirteen in light of the debate on the doctrine of election? Thank you for your work. It is a huge blessing. Thank you, Kenna. And um, I will go to that passage now. Second Thessalonians two thirteen. It says here we are. Back. All right, I'll read before he reads it because I want to. I want to draw up. I think another passage while he's doing this. Um, but we got to go to uh, Ephesians one because Paul has multiple points in in the New Testament where he talks about um, God choosing. Right. Uh, so we got to relate his vocabulary in different books. A little bit. Uh, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Okay, so there's there's the passage, the, the relevant sentence there, right? Um, do you have any thoughts before I say anything? Or uh, No, I, I think Ephesians is kind of what I was thinking initially as well, so... Okay, so he says he right chose away. you. Notice, notice the the grammar is really straightforward. Which is, um, what uh, what order does this happen in, or what is what is which thing causes the other? Which one is? How are these things related to each other? He says God chose you as the first fruits to be saved, right? In other words, yeah. the choice led to the salvation, right? Um, I think this is going to come out as he talks. He he's correct pretty much for the most part about how what how he describes what Reformed theology is surrounding regeneration um, mm -hmm. about the new birth. Thing is, I think he doesn't realize that we would agree with him when when he says the doctrine of regeneration is not even discussed in this verse, right? Yeah, right. Um, so what he says is like here's. Here's what Calvinists think about the new birth. Uh, here's what this passage says. It doesn't say this about the new birth, and therefore it's not related to Calvinism. But in Reformed theology, there's an order to these things. So like, uh, well, we went to Ephesians, but we could also talk about Romans 8. Talks about us being mm -hmm. foreknown by God, right? Which, mm -hmm. if you look in context, um, for God, God knowing someone in the Old Testament sense is almost interchangeable with election or choosing. So it's yeah. those whom he fore knew. Uh, when, when you see that in the old Testament with Abraham, it's uh, it says he knew him in order that X, Y, and Z would happen with him. 
Uh, but in some translations, it just goes ahead and says, God chose him for this. So f- yeah. to know and to choose in this Hebrew thinking is very similar. So in Romans 8, it says, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he would be the first, firstborn among many brethren. Those whom he uh, predestined, he also called. And that's what we experience in the, in the midst of our life. And those whom he called, he justified. And all of these things you could say relate to salvation, right? Yeah. Um, and so when he calls us in the reformed understanding, when he calls us that works in us spiritually and it causes us to have faith and God's able to do that in a way where it's, it is what we want, but it is also, uh, something he's able to infallibly do. And so Mm -hmm. like he's about to point out, he's correct when he says, we would say these things happen at the same time. Uh, our faith does not chronologically follow the new birth, but it logically follows it. It's caused by the new birth. And so faith is the result of God's work. It's not something we do that causes God's work, right? But that's one piece in this whole line of things that happens as a result of the call of God. And all of those things are salvation. Um, And justification, that the justification aspect of salvation does follow the new birth. And so he's right about that as well. But he's taking our understanding of the new birth. And he's saying, we, we relate that to all of these aspects. Um, and so watch what he does here through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. So the the idea here could be like, Hey, God has chosen you. Um, and I can see why I'm trying to think of how like a Calvinist would use this passage in a robust way. Okay, there, there's a not robust way. There, there's a not robust way that maybe some people would use the passage. And they'd say, look, it says that God chose them. So therefore they were chosen. And that's Calvinism. God chooses you. But that's actually not Calvinism. Um, Calvinism is, is saying more than that. It's saying that God chose you and that you believing in him happened after your regeneration. Right. And so yeah. you see there, he, he made saved and regenerate synonymous. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, this is one of the key issues that even R.C. Sproul said was one of the key issues in Calvinism. If you understood it, you understood a lot of the debate. In Calvinism, there is a belief that you believe in God as a result of God re- regenerating you. This is like that moment where you become a new creation in Christ, right? You're filled with the Spirit, right? You're indwelt by the Spirit, and you're a new person, you're forgiven, and you're given a new heart. Now you can't help but believe in God. So that faith comes after regeneration or as a result of regeneration. Some will say it comes at the same time, but the point is that it comes as a result of regeneration. Yeah, he he says some would say it comes at the same time. No, I think anyone who understands it, we would all say it happens at the same time. The the point is the logical connection, not the chronology. Which one is which one is the cause of the other? Any thoughts so far? No, I think I'm tracking with you. Um, I feel like in some ways this is, uh, I'm not trying to necessarily pick on the guy, but it seems like he is mostly focusing on what would the non-robust Calvinist say as uh-huh. the form of his logical breakdown of this passage. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily critically thinking through it. Yeah. I think he um, said he's try- he tried to think of a way, he tried to think of how, he tried to think of the robust, I think here's what he did. He said, I want to think of how a Calvinist would have a robust use of this passage. Yeah. Um, but then when he said robust, he says, I'm going to give you a robust explanation of what Calvinism is and start talking about regeneration, which is a, yeah. you know, it's a robust aspect of Calvinism, but it's not yeah. related to this passage. And so right. it's a more of a distraction from what the passage is saying in a straightforward way here. It is clearly saying that God chose us in order to bring this about. And the Arminian, yeah. I don't know if he would call himself an Arminian, um, but I mean, in terms of the central issue here, here I think that would be an appropriate title. Um, but uh, he, uh, what was I about to say? Um, because God chose you as the first fruits. Yeah. Um, now, in Arminian, generally speaking, now he says here, let me let him get to it, then I'll continue. Not you have faith, and then you're regenerated. So let's read this verse again and ask if it says that. And the answer is going to be no. Um, 
But we well, always, yeah. we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you. I would agree with that. As the first- yeah, so he says, I would agree with that, right? <laughs> um, now I feel well, if we should. It's what the scripture says. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and so I find there are some like uh, default sort of intuitive Armenians who uh, Mm -hmm. came to it like, well, it wouldn't be fair for God to choose people. They aren't aware of the scriptural material on the matter. And so they'll say, no, I don't believe in election or predestination or choosing. Um, He knows what the Bible says. And so he'll say he believes in it, but he obviously has another interpretation of what it means. Um, um, And generally speaking, what the Armenian says is God, they'll, they'll, I don't know if he does this because he doesn't dive into it here, but generally speaking, you'll get some, some philosophical talk about the, the timelessness of God. God saw through the mm-hmm. corridors of time um, that we would believe or that we would re- be responsive. And then yeah. he chose us. And so now for me, when I hear them do that, I think they're turning Paul's whole point on its head. Cause God, I think grounds our salvation in before the foundations of the earth, like he does in Ephesians, which we never ended up reading, but it says he chose us <laughs> before the foundation of the earth. Um, And it's clear Paul's intention in doing that is to take the glory off of us. Our salvation is rooted in something before we even existed. Right. Yeah. Um, Right. And so to then switch and say, but he's doing it based on something he foresaw. Well, now you're putting it back on us again. Yeah. Right. Um, Yeah. And so it's essentially the, am I worthy enough to receive salvation? mm -hmm. Um, The difference is instead of just simply saying, am I, I, I am worthy to receive salvation. It's well, yes, God, foresaw he looked down the hallway of time and saw that i would be worthy uh-huh yeah so, now again to be, it's still now, to be fair to be, i don't want to be unfair to him i know like this is why i like i i still recommend his channel to everyone because when he hits yeah. on the gospel justification by grace alone through faith alone he really gets it right um and he and he's argued against some clips like from james white before on predestination um but he'll point out no it's faith but saying that the human being produces faith uh, without regeneration, that's not, that's not a work. That's not something that we yeah. should call meritorious. Um, and I think we, we, we don't necessarily have to argue with that. Like, sure, faith is not a work, and we'd agree with him. But the question is, does Scripture say or not say that faith is a gift? That faith is something yeah. the Spirit gives. It clearly does. Not in this passage, is clearly, but we could go to a lot of passages. I mean, like Paul says it as like a throwaway line, like a throwaway line at the end of Ephesians, where he's just like, "Love with faith from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ," um, or he talks about it in regards to the Christian life with gifts, like um, as God has apportioned to each a measure of faith. Do and so, mm-hmm. like in the midst of the Christian faith, that's in the midst of the Christian life, that's the case. Or in, as in Philippians, he says, it has been granted to you, not only that you uh, believe in him, but that you suffer for his sake. Um, Yeah. Um, And so, yeah, he says, yeah, I believe that, but I think he's probably got something a little more, a little more of a workaround in mind when he says that. First fruits to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. I actually would say this verse may lean against Calvinism because that last part. How do they get saved? Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So that believing was somehow an active cause of them being saved. Right. And now he's assuming the Calvinist reads reads that and hears saved as synonymous with regeneration. Right? Now we would say, we would agree that in a sense, in the sense of justification, in the sense of um, uh, sanctification, and in the sense of final judgment and all these things, we're saved in all those contexts as a result of our faith. Like, he's right, follows faith. But regeneration doesn't follow faith. All right? these, these aspects of yeah. salvation are separate. Um, but he's, he's assuming the Calvinist sees them all as one thing when they hear the word saved. It seems. Yeah. Yeah. Not a result, a cause. That seems to be something that's there. So God chose you, but you also believed. And that that was one of the things that caused you, right here, to be saved. 
I would actually lean this verse towards a, a verse that would perhaps challenge the Calvinist doctrine that regeneration comes before faith. All right. Well, there you go. Any other thoughts on Mike Winger's take here? No, I mean, I think, I think like you said, I, uh, the main issue that I take with it is he definitely seems to be reading into the argument that he assumes that all Calvinists would say, you know, saved synonymous with regeneration. And, and so it does make it a bit of a, an odd argument. It's arguing against something that's not in the text. And again, he, it's kind of like mm -hmm. arguing against uh, what he supposes the Calvinist would argue for. Yeah. And I generally find that to be the case when it comes to, I mean, you'll see lesser or greater uh, times that this happens, depending who you're talking to, but it generally does tend to come down to there's something, that there has to be some kind of reframing of what the Calvinist is saying in order to argue against it more effectively. Um, yeah. Yeah. And certainly it's it's a big topic, like when you get into the idea of regeneration preceding faith, um, you, you know, you spoke of it logically preceding faith. Um, and, and there are scriptures, I do believe, that point to this. Um, yeah. You know, a fee we referenced Ephesians, but if you get to the second chapter of Ephesians, it talks about God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that being dead in trespasses is unregenerate. Yeah. Um, made us alive together with Christ. Yes. So, you know... It, it, I think that's talking about regeneration taking place, you know, obviously while we were dead in sin. So uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to point to my causality, yeah. my, my choice being causality for uh, regeneration there. It was yeah, God. It's, it's pretty straightforwardly stated there in terms of like, God caused me to be alive. Um, yeah. But generally you'll find, I think the tendency is I have my theology of being born again. Like I believe I come up, I say prayer at the altar or whatever. Again, I don't want to caricature Mike Winger. Like he's sure he sure. thinks through a lot of this stuff pretty well, um, and like he has his own issues with altar calls and modern like evangelism yeah. like tactics and stuff that we would agree with. Um, but like in modern uh, evangelism culture and things like that, you'll find that whole idea of come come forward, say this thing. This will be the cause of the new birth. Yeah, you want to be born again. This is what you do. Um, uh, and so if you have that in your mind tr traditionally, and then you approach a verse like the one you just said, um, you kind of insert that into, well, he made me alive. When did he make me alive? Well, he made me alive after I said the sinner's prayer. Hmm. Right. And that's all kind of in the back of the mind as you read scripture. And it's just sort of yeah. sneaking in there instead of just taking and saying, no, God made you alive. Yeah. And then let's work out where the sinner's prayer fits in relation to that. <laughs> after scripture. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, th but I think um, we have to talk, if we're going to talk about regeneration, the where Calvinists get this idea, um, we have to talk about first John, which, which passage was it? Uh, yeah, there it is. First yeah. John five, one, first verse. Um, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Yep. Right Gr now, not every translation reflects, I guess the Greek, grammar there to the same extent but this one in esv which mike winger used himself actually so he might yeah well if i doubt he's ever going to watch this but if he did <laughs> esv has the has the grammar right here everyone who believes that jesus is the christ that's in the present um has been born of god that's before in other words and we you could i can think of some ways you could see that grammar is ambiguous um but if you look at the whole point of the book, it has this same grammatical structure, but with other things besides just faith. It talks about uh, loving the brethren and things like that. It talks about overcoming the world. People who do all these things have been born of God. And we would yeah. never say those things cause us to be born of God. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. And so first John, I think is a, is a good place to go to for the, if you want to know where uh, where in the world Calvinists are getting this idea of yeah regeneration preceding faith yeah, yeah. well and, and 
in many of these instances, you know, context matters significantly. And I think, you know, just talking about First John 5, 1, um, you know, the, the grammar there is important and understanding the context. John is writing to a church um, of believers who have experienced traumatic uh, splitting of the church. And he's writing to show some things that give evidence of salvation. Um, you know, so that, that is a theme that reoccurs throughout that letter. Mm -hmm. And he's not writing to say, you know, if you do this, you will be born again, like you just spoke of. And he's writing to believers to say, these are evidences of your belief. Or of your new birth. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Get it right. <laughs> oh, now, now I done, I done messed us up. Uh, you know what that means? Blasphemy. <laughs> or, or Did it twice in one What's day. What's wrong with you people? 